Russian School of Chess contains several different basic ideas of a strategy, coordinated attack, and tactics. Um, every strong player today, beginning strong master and up to the uh, very elite of chess players, they do play using basics of components, probably all components of Russian chess school. Some of them learned it as a Russian chess school and some of them didn't, but they still play that way. The why this happens is because they follow basics of Russian chess school will make you a very strong player. But if you never followed and never studied those basics, you just see the games of best chess players. And as you see, as you play more and more and more games and you become better chess players, whether you like it or not, you are using those principles without even knowing. And they make a lot of sense. And finally, you become very strong players. And in your arsenal is all the weapons. You have all the weapons of the Russian chess school. Let me give you Fisher example. Fisher, for example, there weren't that many super strong players, but he was studying games of Russian players when he was very young, 10, 11 years old. He was studying uh, what they had to say about it. He even learned uh, some chess uh, <coughs> so little uh, Russian that is enough to uh, read the chess books. So, and that's, that helped him a great, great deal. I know this for fact. Fisher himself, even though later on he demolished all Russian players, but the school, he did not demolish Russian chess school. He used it as a weapon. Now, let me show you <coughs> some of the important components. Now, we just saw in the French how we can uh, dominate dark squares. The idea of playing on weak squares is very, very common. Well, this is completely different opening. It's a different opening, but you can see the similarity of ideas. You're going to face them now, e5, d5. It's one of the openings I recommend. And actually, the main reason I recommend this opening, it's not because <clears throat> in scratch or two knights defense, you get better positions than you get in a Rui Lopez. Not by any means, but... The reason why I recommend, because you learn here a lot about strategy, about blockade, about attack. Now, I'm not going to go through opening for the sake uh, of learning opening, but I'm going to show you, outline you basic strategical points. This is very, very important. Bishop b5, bishop d7 also can be played bishop c5, but that doesn't change much as far as white's strategy goes. Bishop d7, bishop takes c6, pawn takes c6, castle. Now what we want, we want uh, to exchange those knights to bring the bishop to e3, and to play knight b3, generating total blockade of dark squares. 
Of course, it's not as easy to achieve as I just mentioned. Black can cooperate or black can try uh, to stop that. Well, in this position, black has moved bishop e7, bishop c5, and pawn c5. Well, with the pawn c5, white gets an advantage after knight b3, and I don't want to go into details because this is not uh, the su uh, subject. M my goal is not uh, for you to learn this opening in this because we have DVDs on that. But most common and main move is bishop c5. Now, bishop c5 or bishop e7, in both cases, you get an advantage. But it is, it's interesting. So in one case, we get an attack. In the other case, we get positional grip on dark squares. Let me see. So if we want to get control on d4 and c5 squares, maybe it's better idea for black to play bishop e7. But we will come back to this. Bishop c5, we go f3, knight g5, f4, knight e4. So, eventually this position is played with knight d2. Well, actually, even if it's black smooth here, they can go bishop b6, they will go knight c3. But the type of position is this. Knight d2, knight takes d2, and queen takes d2. When black castles, then knight b3 and bishop b6, queen to c3. You see, next you're going to go knight c5, bishop d4. With total blockade, just as we saw in the French defense. So, And then you have potential of f5. This is absolutely beautiful uh, setup for white with potential of a very strong attack. Every positional advantage, when you have big positional advantage and controlling on the square, it has to follow by some concrete way to take advantage of it. In this case, it will be the king side attack. Now, let's try black to interfere with our plans. So you supposed to, be, by now, all chess players know, all reasonable chess players know that getting, uh, allowing this blockade is not a good idea, and obviously they will try to stop that. After e4, e5, um, knight f3, knight c6, d4, ed, bishop c4, knight f6, e5, d5, bishop b5, knight e4, knight takes d4, bishop d7, bishop takes c6, pawn takes, and we castle. So we just saw bishop c5 move, and then we do f3, knight g5, f4, and a knight e4, bishop e3. And we are happy with this position. So if black goes bishop b6, you do not go knight d2 because blockade on dark squares fails now because black goes c5. And after knight b3, black has knight takes d2 Queen takes d2 followed by d4 and bishop c6. That's something you don't want to happen, but on the other hand, you need to have the blockade enforced. So what you do in this position, you go knight c3, because after c5 you go knight b3, and black 
if black takes on c3, obviously they cannot go d4. And it's interesting that even here, black has significant problems. On c4, we can go two different ways. We can go knight c5 and continue with blockade with a chance of kingside attack, or we can go knight d4 and after c5, knight e2. Now, bishop on b6 is not too good, and we have a chance to create kingside attack. And any time black pushes d4, we can just move the bishop. You see, it's very hard for black to bring this b6 bishop into the game. And our threats on king's side are very, very real. Well, this is actually, not, but you see, now everybody knows, every reasonably good player knows that they shouldn't allow this kind of blockade, the one we got. But they never learn. If you go uh, through, if you went through Russian chess school the way I did, I did go well, uh, through that school, and I will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, I know I read it from there that is good. But I, that was <coughs> maybe like 40 years ago, uh, maybe even longer. And, uh, but today's kids, they didn't go through that, but it's already, they saw so many games performed that way. They already know by the number of games they look and by the results that this is not good. So we had to learn and understand in order to use it. But today is a lot easier to learn chess. Today it comes to you all prepared and already once you look games, it's all in there. And your knowledge and your strength in chess comes with these basic ideas. So no matter when do you learn, did you learn chess 50 years ago or five days ago? Principles stay the same, basics are the same, and that's what ch uh, chess is um, uh, revolving around. So I will show you now, I want to show you a couple of, a uh, talk to, a uh, uh, couple of other aspects of uh, this strategy. Well, I think we are already advanced enough, if we're watching this DVD, to know, uh, to know the importance of quick development, active development, and space. I'm not going to be talking to that because this is kind of for beginners, but I will, what amazes me that I see some players, some pretty strong players, uh, they, of course they know all that, but how severely they violating these rules. Oh, they may say, you know what, I know this is so, I know these rules, I know it's, but this is good too. This is good also. And I want to do that. Well, here is my answer to that. They may be right. Maybe this is good, whatever they're suggesting. And this may, they may be correct. But here is this. They cannot be correct if it's not within basic rules of Russian chess school. If they violate this principle, they are 100% wrong. Because we are not taking, there is some position maybe they tell you to go and develop control of this and this square, schools tells you. But you may have a combination that wins a piece. We are not talking about some concrete refutations. We're talking about building the plan in a chess game. You cannot play today 
game without building and having solid uh, plan unless you are playing some beginner or you are beginner yourself then you're gonna have some difficulties doing it well let's let's see about some other aspects of strategy such as uh, development on active positions here I am playing some a strong international master uh, from Yugoslavia and this game was played many years ago um, and I was absolutely stunned the way he handled middle game the guy was a very original chess player and he violated some some rules that I was very happy to uh, uh, punish him for that it was my personal satisfaction that so the ground rules that I learned about development, about coordination of pieces, stood and we did uh, punish opponent for that. And this game was playing, played in 73 and I was playing white. So I played simply C4, it's a King's Indian defense, G6. Knight c3, bishop g7, d4, d6, e4, knight d7. Well, this is a little awkward way of playing King's Indian, but there's nothing wrong. Knight f3, e5, d5. And here my opponent played knight h6 as opposed to normal knight f6. Idea of knight h6 is very obvious. Black doesn't want to block the f pawn and they want to go f5 soon. So uh, after knight h6, I just developed bishop e2. Both sides castled. So far, there is nothing wrong about development of any side. Both sides castled. Black went a5 preparing the outpost for the knight on c5, which is okay, a3, and now knight c5. Uh, after knight c5, white has to try to go b4. Obviously, they cannot go b4 because rook is hanging on a1. So they have to uh, make sure the rook is protected, but if we go rook b1, then black goes a4. So the typical move for those positions is b3 move. After b3, uh, and now we want to go rook b1 and then, and then b4. b3, f5 was played. That's what white was playing for. f5 was played. Bishop g5, queen to e8. Knight to d2. Knight f7. Bishop e3. You see, bishop cannot be trapped because this is another position. Actually, what would have happened if black played f4? This is very important to notice. f4 is a very bad move. And positionally, white will have big, big advantage because they play bishop takes c5, pawn takes c5. You notice that this bishop is totally out of game. And now white will exchange their bad bishop for black's good bishop. And we have closed position where knights are two knights versus knight and bishop. This is a big positional advantage for, uh, for white. So in this position, black does not want obviously to have 
to to close the center. <coughs> so what what happened here? After bishop g5, queen e, queen e8, bishop was g5, queen e8, knight d2, knight f7, bishop e3. Now black goes bishop h6. And it's obvious that they want to exchange dark square bishops because then they are not going to have a bad bishop on g7 and plus the center is potentially may open and they may have good play here. But then white goes b4, knight d7, <clears throat> and when I talk to you about development, you will see how position can drastically change in the next few moves. How white, <coughs> having more space, can quickly develop very dangerous initiative. Uh, after b4, knight d7, e takes f, <coughs> G takes F, Bishop takes Bishop, and Knight takes Bishop. It looks like looks okay for Black, and they have uh, centralized pawns, and they all they have to do to play Knight F6 and Bishop D7, finishing development. But now knight b5. Here comes very strong play by white. It totally demolishes black's position and they won't let black develop successfully. Queen d8, c5, d takes c. Now we are attacking d6 pawn. <coughs> And it's interesting to point here, it doesn't matter, white sacrifices pawn, d takes c, queen to b3. Now you see that we have potential threat of d6 check, followed by d takes c. After queen b3, king h8 was played, and the white goal in this position to open game as much as possible. Rook a to c1, attacking the c pawn. After a takes b, a takes b, uh, it's um, obvious that taking b4 pawn will be very bad for black. So in this position, I would say that black is um, already in severe trouble. Rook f6 was played, starting to pre trying to prevent in the d6. Uh, after rook f6, knight c4. This is another very powerful move. We still want to go d6. And e5 pawn may be under attack soon. It's just in general, concretely, it. It doesn't have any concrete threat, this move, but we're bringing more pieces. Now you can tell how in three last three, four moves, white gave up a pawn, but they have absolutely dominating pieces uh, over black, um, over black. So after knight c4, knight f7 was played, b takes c and c6 here well if knight takes c5 queen e3 black has a lot of problems that are very difficult to solve attacking pawn and the knight black decided to go c6 and uh, try to relieve the pressure D takes C, B takes C, and Knight to D6. 
queen to f8 was played knight takes f7 queen takes f7 and I played queen c3 this position I can tell if I had to assess today I would say black is absolutely lost the black is lost because e5 pawn is hanging white has b6 and d6 square for knight all pieces are perfectly developed black's king is exposed and the bishop and rook are badly placed totally undeveloped that is normally should be enough to win the game after queen c3 queen e6 was played pawn has to be protected rook f to d1 and now a <coughs> series of tactical shots which is normal when you have overwhelming activity of the pieces it's almost inevitable that side with big uh, advantage in activity uh, will have some tactical shots rook fd1 knight takes c5 and this is not an exception knight takes c5 knight b6 attacking rook and the knight and this is a tactical shot because knight a4 was played and that was was prepared for black and now queen g3 all of a sudden leaving knight on pre because of threat rook d8 checkmate and it's forced for black to play rook g6 and after rook g6 rook d8 check king g7 and there is another shot queen to a3 now you see knight hangs rook hangs bishop hangs and queen f8 mate threatening this is already we are using that's not the only way probably to win for white but this is clear-cut result of what activity can do to your opponent and I believe, and very important while you're playing that, uh, your psychologically that you believe that you have to capitalize on this big advantage. And I believed in it. And once you believe, your search level goes higher. So you, it's easier for you to find critical blows to your opponent. So now after queen a3, queen f6 was played, but uh, here simply rook takes c8, knight takes b6, uh, rook takes a8, knight takes a8, and here one last uh, shot for um, white. If we play queen takes a8, that's a tactical shot too. Then black has queen g5 attacking white's rook and threatening checkmate. And uh, I don't know if white can win. Maybe white loses. But white can win in this position easily by playing queen a7 check and taking knight very next move regardless what black does if black goes queen f7 then we take the knight and there is no more queen g5 and if black did what they do they went queen h king h6 then queen takes a8 and now Queen g5 doesn't do anything either because queen f8 check wins outright. Only legal move rook g7 and then rook takes c6 check and black has to play queen g6. Give up a queen and the game. This actually, I was proud 
I was proud. I played it in 73, uh, almost 25 years ago. I was proud not because I played absolutely brilliant game, not at all. And by then I was strong enough player to realize that that uh, that's not this is far from being brilliant game. But what was good about it? Why I felt so good about it? Because I felt that my initiative should be decisive. And whatever I believed on, I believed in in activity, I believed in peace coordination, which I had, and I believed this should bring to a win. And my confidence in my beliefs uh, rised, and I see that, oh yes, whatever I learned, I learned from theory first, theoretically heard, and then I played. Rather, but most of the strong players today, they're learning differently. They're learning from what they see, from examples and practice, and then they do it themselves. Uh, well, I was very pleased when I saw that happen. And, well, really, that's one of the basic rules about ra playing chess right, which is part of the Russian chess school system. It worked, and I was very pleased with the result. I want to see, I want to show you another one of my uh, games played in 1973 against one of the chess legends that one of the most talented players ever lived, David Bronstein. Uh, the reason I'm showing my games uh, on this specific DVD is because it's about Russian chess school. I went through, I was raised, once I learned how to move pieces, since then I learned and I was raised and on the, only with the basic principles of Russian chess school and I was fortunate enough to have coaches that uh, put me all the way through this school and that's why it's easy for me when I show my some of my games I'm showing what I learned from there and how effective it might be <clears throat> now this game was played in 1973 in Russia against David Bronstein e4 c5 I'm black knight f3 knight c6 d4 c takes d knight takes d4 knight f6 knight c3 d6 bishop g5 e6 this is already also already very well known in theory and it was very popular at that time queen d2 a6 white castles long um, bishop d7 f4 bishop e7 we are still in a theory uh, knight f3 b5 bishop takes f6 of course we have to take with a pawn otherwise d6 pawn would fall uh, gf g3 b4 uh, after b4 knight e2 queen b6 king b1 castle knight to c1 now what about this position black has very good center actually controlling all central squares but after knight c1 king b8 white went f5 and here is what white is trying to do white is trying to put a lot of pressure on e pawn to make black go e5 
which will weaken d5 square, you know, for white pieces. And after f5, this looks, e takes f, looks positionally terrible because weakens all, every one of black pawns on a board. His terrible pawn structure. But this is the critical moment of the game. I didn't want to be subjected to bishop h3 and farther pressure on e6, and I wanted active play. I did play e takes f, and this has very good justification. After e takes f, bishop takes f5, obviously here I wasn't too proud of my extra pawn. But what did we do with it? Now, our bishop can go back to e6, and our knight will come to e5, and I'm going to push my d pawn. You see, weakened king side for black, uh, weakened king side is not that dangerous because white's king is on a queen, uh, king's position, I'm not king's side, king's, because white's king is on the same side and white is restricted a little bit with uh, uh, advancing pawns on queen's side. So after bishop takes f5, well here it came queen f4, bishop e6, knight h4. And white wants to play knight on f5 correctly and uh, having pressure on black's position. And after knight h4, knight e5, knight f5, bishop takes f5, queen takes f5. White has far better pawn structure. Uh, black has extra pawn that is absolutely meaningless. The pawn, I don't even know which pawn is extra pawn of mine, but that's such a terrible pawn structure. But we have knight on e5, centralized. We have potential opening uh, bishop, and we have potential of opening the c file. And knight on e5 is worth a lot. And in this position, believe it or not, I did like my... Uh, at this point, I did like my position. Now, what this has to do with Russian school of chess? Because there are some positional advantages in disadvantages. Russian chess school cannot be used, never, based on one positional component. For example, if it was based on one positional component, we could say, Black has absolutely terrible pawn structure, white pawn structure is much better, and white is winning. No. There are other components. I knew that, what about the pawn structure. But I did like very much my dominating knight on e5. And I did like very much of pushing b5 and potentially creating an attack on king's side. What else I like that Opposite color bishops, opposite color bishops, when attack goes, in attack, in the end game, it's very peaceful factor, it's because most of the end game with the opposite color bishops may end in a draw. In attack, it's when you have some kind of attack in sharp position, opposite color bishops make it a lot sharper. And well, here, now, what this position is all about, whether white can make blockade quicker than black can create an attack. So blockade means, for example, if white could play bishop g2 and bishop d5, black will be in grave danger. But... We just played 
Why just to queen takes f5 and now d5? So there will be no blockade on d5. Bishop g2, rook to d7. Rook h to e1, rook h to d8. Queen takes h7. There goes black's extra pawn. But that wasn't uh, my main point why I went for this position, not the extra pawn. So extra pawn on h7 meant nothing. I went a5, knight d3, knight takes d3. Queen takes d3, and a4. <clears throat> black maybe it would be ideal for black to play bishop d6 and bishop e5 getting b bishop on this long diagonal but bishop d6 will be met by queen takes d5 so we just went um, a a4 and white played h4 well just activating their pass pawn because black does not have a pawn on that file. A3, H5. Now why didn't white go B3? B3 weakens potentially diagonal, very dangerous diagonal for black bishop. White went H5. What white is trying to do here to push H pawn far enough to distract one of black's rooks. H5, F5, <clears throat> queen B3, A takes B, rook E3, and rook A7. You see now that black has real threats. Rook A3 possible, bishop comes to F6, uh, so, after rook a7, a4 was played. Obviously, I cannot take ampassant because my queen is hanging. But on a4, bishop f6, supporting the b2 pawn, rook e2, d3, attacking d5 pawn, and queen to b5. This is very strong move because threatens queen takes a4 or rook takes a4 with mate on a1 and obviously white cannot take the queen because of ch checkmate so what happened after queen b5 c3 rook takes a4 queen takes b2 and it looks like good, good position for white because white wants to play rook takes d5. But after rook a3, uh, white is lost. After rook a3, there is no good defense. You see, if queen takes b4, then rook b3 check. That's a highly unusual uh, move and uh, wins the queen you white cannot take with the pawn because the queen is hanging and after rook a3 there is practically no defense rook takes d5 rook takes d5 rook takes d5 and queen b6 and at this point uh, black is threatening queen g1 check Black is threatening, bishop takes c3, and white does not have uh, sufficient defense. And white is uh, totally lost here. What happened, bishop f1, and now if I try to play bishop takes c3, then white has a draw, because queen takes a3, pawn takes, and rook b5. That's where opposite color bishops will lead to a draw. And, well, obviously, I didn't 
play that move and I simply went king c7 getting out of the pin and after rook b5 uh, and this was uh, played queen e3 and after queen e2 uh, one little finesse uh, made in combination rook a1 check forced to take queen takes c3 check king a2 or king b3 that makes no difference because eventually it comes to the same king b1 queen b3 check only move and now bishop g5 it's a diagonal crisscross uh, winning uh, black white queen and uh, the game actually I was proud of this game it was executed well but it also there was the conflict of basic principles weak pawns attack counterattack opposite color bishops and it was a very very complicated conflict of uh, strategical ideas and I think at some point white had an advantage and I think black, white should have played better could have played better but that's different so we see how when you know all good and bad points of uh, uh, exposed king of uh, opposite color bishops of pawn weaknesses how you can explore when you don't know what is better you have to try your best and that's where tactics uh, come uh, very handy and this was actually very very interesting and uh, uh, creative uh, game. One of the very important components of the right positional play, good positional play, is maneuvering. Uh, I, I don't think if I ever played a game with all my eight pawns on board in a final position except for the one I'm going to show you now. This game I played uh, in uh, 1990 in interzonal tournament again very strong Yugoslavian Grandmaster Goran Cabrillo and I won this game with all eight pawns on board on each side where I had no immediate threat and this is highly unusual how badly it was played by black strategically well let's see the game knight f3 knight f6 g3 b6 bishop g2 bishop b7 it's kind of king's indian setup for white uh, uh, bishop b7 castle c5 d3 g6 e4 d6 rook e1 e5 c3 bishop g7 d4 knight bd7 and d5 for white black castle i went a4 and what can we say about this position? White has potential outpost for a knight. The knight will be placed here. Of course, black has several ways um, to create in counterplay. So they start after a4, they played knight e8, with typical for those type of positions, f5 uh, idea. After uh, knight e8, knight a3 was played, and f5 immediately may be dangerous because of knight g5 with a potential knight e6, so h6 was played. h6 to prevent 
a knight g5, bishop d2, and once again, white cannot really comfortably play a5 because of knight h4 move, attacking g6, and potentially f5 may be weak, protecting g6 with king h7 could be met by queen c2 or maybe even e takes f and knight takes f5 with the immediate punishment and after rook takes e5 bishop e4 attacking pinning the rook with the idea g4 so f5 at this point uh, is uh, not good so on the other hand White is continuing their plan, so knight c7 was played, and after knight c7, knight c4, attacking d6 pawn, queen e7, and now b4. White wants to open position on a queen side. After b4, uh, black plays rook a to d8. And queen c1. Queen c1 is very interesting move. Attacking h6 pawn. And uh, uh, after black plays king h7, now queen c2. See, making f5 very difficult for uh, black. Now if f5, e takes f, g takes f, knight h4 will be decisive. So it, once again black cannot go f5 and you have to notice that if black doesn't play f5 they have absolutely no counterplay so bishop c8 was played now i played b5 with the potential of going a5 if i went a5 black could have played b5 following by closing the queen side but c4 square is very important for white's knight so b5 so what we do here we have totally dominating knight on c4 and here the way you think about this position you know many people can say but what is knight on c4 doing it doesn't attack b6 and d6 is also protected but when position opens and if position opens power of knight on c4 will be devastating meanwhile knight is keeping black's queen occupied with defense of d6 pawn okay uh, after b5 black played a5 Black didn't want white to go a5 and open the file. a5, in my opinion, is very bad move positionally because now knight on d7 is totally tied up with protecting b6. Now we have a paralyzed piece one and paralyzed piece two. But, on the, but the good news for black that black sealed the queen side. Now rook e2, why rook e2? Because we are preparing for actions on the king side for white. I want to keep rook on e2, bring the other rook on f1, and make somehow f4 possible. So rook e2 is a good positional move. Knight a8, protecting b6 pawn to free the d7 knight. Knight a8, rook f1, knight f6, knight e1, rook f e8. At this point, black has absolutely no plan, nor they can have any. Knight d3, bishop b7, rook e2, e1, knight d7 f4 f6 black is 100 percent passive now h4 
This is very, very good positional move. Idea on bishop c8, I went h5, and black went g5. If g takes h, this pawn will be taken maybe with the rook even. There are many ways, uh, and it's total, absolutely weak pawn on h5. g5 was played, and now bishop h3. You see another terrible square and possibly can be occupied with a knight, f5 square. After bishop h3, knight f8, and light square bishops were exchanged. That's what white wants. Now all black's light squares on f5 and g4 are totally weak. And here is only pawn was exchanged. f takes e, d takes e, and knight e3. You see the exposed f5 square? Knight e3, knight d7, and now knight b2. So as I mentioned, c4 is potentially very strong square and the other knight is going to f5. Black is absolutely unconditionally lost here. Knight c7, after knight b2, knight c7, knight bc4, queen f8, and queen d1. Well, in this position, white is going to play queen g4, then double rooks on f file, with a potential of d6 and knight f5. It's absolutely hopeless and helpless position for black. I uh, remember one of the participants of the tournament, they said that this is probably the biggest positional advantage they have ever seen, where we have no threats, but black's position strategically is so hopeless that they reside. So what did white do here? White got the c4 square only on a board for good position for a knight and totally uh, blocked black's uh, counterplay with f5. If f in those positions, if you cannot make f5, basically in a closed positions of King's Indian, if you cannot play a five, you likely to uh, get no counterplay and your position will slowly be going down. This is very good and very interesting example of bad maneuvering. Now, I said in the beginning that there will be, um, that we're gonna talk about various different components of not only strategy, but something is that is very important is calculations. How do you calculate? Calculations, to explain you verbally, it's hard to bring a lot of examples on calculations because it's millions and none of them will be very uh, very well explaining to you. What calculations, you have to try to calculate more frequently and that's how you get experience. But you have to have positional knowledge. You cannot calculate like computers do. Computers calculate every possible move. Most logical and absolutely meaningless go in the same bucket and the computer calculates all. But what we do is we, based on our intuition and based on the principles, we have to pick the continuation and calculate. And that's how we're gonna 
be uh, improving in that. And it's just a matter of practice. There is no pill, there is no medicine for good calculations. Calculations, you don't learn, you don't study calculations. There is no book that teaches you how to calculate. It's a matter of practice, and remember, when you do calculate, calculate variations that make sense, they have position or ground. Well, let me show you one of my favorite players when I was um, growing up as a chess player was Efim Geller. Uh, I want to show you one game he played against Lajos Sport is one of the top players at that time. It was played in 1967. And this is a good example of attack. Attack, there are different types of attacks. Attack that was slowly built and based on space, based of, on coordinations, or based on uh, peace concentrations. But there are some attacks that are instant attacks. Sometimes attack may prevail, and it should prevail, when you have big concentration of your pieces versus much smaller concentration of the pieces of opponent. For example, if you have five pieces attacking, two or three defending, all and you now it has to work. But sometimes attack is instant. It's hardly started preparing and in two, three moves, devastation. Well, this is, the Geller was good at those attacks. Now let me show you this game against Lajos Portis. Some calculation involved in that too. And there is tactical shots, there is instant attack, and uh, 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 th there is uh, quick peace movement. So everything is very instructive. E45, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6. Very well known position of Rui Lopez. Castle, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b6, d3, d6, bishop b3, d6, c3, castle, h3, h6. That's not a very well-known uh, continuations. It's possible continuations, but I don't like, because only thing h6 does, it prevents w one of the white pieces going to g5, but it becomes a target in the future by itself, and you will see what happened. d4, rook e8, knight bd2, bishop f8, knight f1, it's a typical for uh, Roy Lopez play, bishop b7, knight g3, queen d7. I think it's hard to uh, imagine, hard to construct a quieter position than this. You see you have eight pawns on board, uh, position is very quiet, and uh, most of those Rui Lopez games, they end it in a, they ending in a draw. But however, here, Geller noticed there is a way of creating unprepared attack. D takes E. This is actually was, uh, I, I was v extremely impressed with this game. D takes E and D takes E. Very simple. Now black wants to exchange queens which will simplify position. And here, unexpected shot, knight h5. Actually, knight on h5 cannot be taken because queen is hanging, as you can tell. 
and if queen takes d1 then knight takes f6 creating serious weakness in black spawn structure so portage did not do it so black after knight h5 played queen e7 everything looks safe but now knight h4 now creating threat of knight f5 or maybe knight g6 black is already experiencing serious problems knight takes h5 queen takes h5 now this is already critical because knight f5 is coming and knight g6 so this bishop on b3 is very powerful and it's natural only natural that black wants to get rid of that bishop or just chase it away and then they can go g6 and consolidate the position but but here uh, white is winning with another shot bishop g5 is the final blow and black is lost taking g5 bishop g5 bishop on g5 is not possible because on queen takes white plays queen takes f7 check and queen g8 mate and uh, pawn takes is not any better than that because knight g6 followed by queen h8 checkmate and black has no defense so queen has to move and queen has to move to d7 to protect the f7 pawn then rook a to d1 attacking the queen and after bishop d6 it's a final blow bishop takes h6 you see all white pieces in attack bishop takes h6 pawn takes and now everything is forced queen g6 check king f8 queen f6 threatening is knight g6 check followed by queen h8 mate and after queen uh, f6 king g8 rook e3 it's interesting white did not have an attack all of a sudden after d takes c and knight h5 you see bishop is very important piece in attack because made all this thing possible queen is on f6 knight is ready for checkmating attack this rook is in attack and this bishop this uh, rook on d1 made uh, bishop go to d6 and pin bishop every piece is in action and after rook e3 black resign this is extremely powerful game very very well played by geller and i was very impressed so it's actually typical there are some Rui Lopez games where uh, one side is hardly prepared for uh, attack hardly prepared but threats coming up so unexpectedly that an attack becomes frequently uh, decisive now next game I also I also like very much this game this game uh, was played by Geller against another uh, uh, Polish master it was played in 1966 actually it was very impressive and very um, very instructive mostly by the simplicity it was very simply played but very consistently by white and i did like this game very much c4 knight f6 
knight c3 c5, knight f3 knight c6, d4 cd, knight takes d4 g6, knight c2, bishop g7, e4. Well, we have one of the varieties of accelerated draken Marozzi bind position where white played knight c2. Uh, e4, d6, bishop e2, bishop e6. I, I don't really like this move because I like when for black to castle first and maybe later go bishop d7, a6 and trying b5, but you can hardly uh, say that bishop e6 is definitely a mistake. Castle, rook c8, bishop e3, and here black supposed to castle, but this move I think was a mistake. Why black is maneuvering with maneuvering with knight and going with not neglecting castling and they don't have really very good reason for playing knight d7 in this very early stage. Knight d4, knight c5, queen d2. What white does is very simple. They try to bring all their pieces ready for action in the center. Queen d2, a6. Again, unknown purpose because there is no b5. Quite simply goes rook b1 trying to play b4. Now bishop goes to d7. It's too much waste of time b4, knight e6. Knight takes e6 and bishop takes e6. Well, let's look at the black, black's knight from g8 is gone. Now, no one that I know that knows how to think logically, and when you talk about Russian school of chess. They don't teach you something that you have to remember, memorize and write it down. Everything is pure logic. Now, logically, how can we approve? The black's knight on g8 was, went to f6, went to d7, then it went to c5, then it went to e6, where it was taken. This is four moves to be exchanged for the knight that made two moves. This is critically wrong and black is still having some space disadvantage. Now knight d5 by white and now finally black castles. White goes rook f to d1, and white has serious space advantage, and black has zero counterplay. I play accelerated dragon myself, and I know when you get in a total bind and you have no counterplay, it's a very, very difficult to survive. Uh, after Rook f to uh, rook a b1. Well, now black goes f5. f5 trying to get some life, some counterplay. E takes f, bishop takes f5. Rook c1. Queen e8. Bishop g5. Now. These pawns cannot be moved because they be, will become targets right away. And for the first time, uh, white has direct threat. The threat is e7 pawn, which is currently protected. So b5 is a threat. And when knight moves, e7 pawn falls. 
So Rook F7 was played, protecting the E pawn. Look at this how simple White played this position, and how decisive it is. Simple and consistent. Uh, after Rook F7, Rook E1 was played. Now it's obviously that's the file White Rook wants to stand on. Knight D4, Bishop F1. Now e7 pawn hangs e5, knight b6, rook b8, and c5. And here black has already no defense. Bishop c4 is coming, There's, there are too many threats, and Black goes downhill real quick. D takes C, B takes C, B, Queen C6. Now on Bishop C4 probably they will play Bishop E6, but Knight C4 was played. Knight C4 attacking E pawn, threatening Knight D6. You see all white pieces are totally dominating. Every piece is coordinating with attacking black center. Knight after knight c4, e4 was played, knight d6, rook d7 was played, bishop c4 check, and bishop e6, and queen b4. Now all black's position is already collapsing, h6. Bishop takes e6, knight takes e6, and queen b3. Now this knight cannot be protected, e4 pawn is hanging, while if pawn takes bishop, queen takes knight is devastating, and it's interesting that there is no way to protect this e6 knight. e7 square is taken, e8 square is taken, and after rook takes d6, cd, queen takes d6, and rook takes e4, it's a final blow, and it's totally hopeless for uh, black. It's totally hopeless for black. Black resigned here. Well, I want to point here that when we talk about Russian school of chess, what is Russian school of chess means? It means they will teach you how to play chess right. We obviously cannot capture all these chess lessons because you need to study chess uh, maybe hundreds of uh, and hundreds of hours over uh, over the period of time. And here on DVD, we cannot give you complete lesson what to do, but we're going to give you pieces of it and we'll explain you how to think. And logically, you have, you have to remember some basics and logically you have to be analyzing position and come to conclusion based on these basic principles. So it's all logic. So I give, gave you some examples and I will give you more examples and, take and talk about uh, different aspects of uh, uh, this chess school. And we'll be talking about initiative, about positional sacrifices and so on.